Hi, I'm Carlo Dell, and I have the opportunity today to do a book review with you of one of my favorite books by a favorite researcher. It's Social Physics by Alex Pentland, who goes by the nickname Sandy, and the reason we know that is that Sandy spoke as a keynoter at one of our conferences. I got to interview Sandy um, at another time, and you can find actually my full interview with Sandy on the web. But what's going to be different about this presentation is that the highlights of social physics, which I'm going to cover very briefly, are ones that we think really relate to what knowledge management can learn from social networking. And I'm doing this on behalf of our advanced working group. And there's really three things that our advanced working group in knowledge management this year is working on that this is relevant for. One is we're very interested in what we can learn from social networking that will um, inform our decisions going forward about how we implement other new technologies and new ways of working. And the second is that we're very interested in how we can influence behavior. And if there's one thing this book talks about is how we influence each other's behavior. And then the third reason is that we'll find that one of the things that makes groups more creative and innovative is their ability to bring in ideas from outside. And that is certainly one of the things that we hope that cognitive computing in the future can help do for us so that we don't just limit our sphere of understanding to those things in our immediate environment that we're working on but can come from much farther away. So those are three reasons for doing this. I'm going to do something else different too, which is because I had the chance to interview Sandy, I have a chance for you to hear him in his own words. So I've taken very small clips of that interview and have inserted them uh, on some of the slides that you'll be seeing to um, uh, show you and let you hear Sandy say it himself. So let's get started. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. So Alex is actually, Alex or Sandy, uh, heads the MIT Human Dynamics Laboratory, and that's where we first heard of him when his group had led the uh, Red Balloon Challenge, which was a, a contest that DARPA had put together to see if they could use social networking to identify 10 red weather balloons around the country and who could do it the fastest, and MIT won by enlisting a social network and having people invite their friends and then giving people incentives to actually uh, do it. So it worked terrifically. Uh, Alex is a computer scientist that's known around the world. He's got two big interests. One is uh, social networking and what he calls social physics, which I'll explain in a minute. And his other big interest is in this whole question of uh, big data and data privacy, which is, of course, very relevant for all of us. So how did he collect the data that said that some groups were, in fact, more uh, productive and innovative than others? And rather than use self-report or uh, doing text analysis of people's um, conversations, he used something called reality mining. And reality mining is a new science that's based on actually uh, identifying the patterns of interaction between people, not necessarily the content of what they're sharing. But let me let you uh, hear Alex say it in his own words, how he did it. What I did is, what I, did is I built little badges, like name badges, that had uh, little IR receivers, like, you know, in your TV remote. So when two people come together, the two little name badges see each other and shake hands and, you know, write down that, oh, these two people actually talked for a while. And, and so you get real objective data about the pattern of conversation. And we never record words and things like that because words are very slippery things and it freaks people out to have the idea that, you know, Somebody's recording your words all of the time. But, but folks don't mind, mind so much if it's, you know, sort of just, oh, you two guys talk. Because, you know, we're you, you. So it gets around some of the issues that so many of us have about uh, invasion of privacy. Based on that data and literally thousands and thousands of interactions, he found a couple of things. One, which is, won't surprise anybody, that we are very social creatures and that we can actually nudge each other's behavior. In fact, by what we do, there's a very teachable moment in an employee's life, and that's when they first join a group or they first join an organization. And at that moment, they are looking for social cues of what is appropriate behavior. And it's during that little window of opportunity that we can say that sharing is appropriate behavior, tagging is appropriate behavior, uh, what's appropriate in our group, sharing ideas. And that has been a powerful thing that he has found in his research, that in fact, we do drive those kind of behaviors. So that's one thing that we can think about 
Uh, they, his, his group and others have done the uh, research on what you weigh as a function of the people around you and how much they weigh. Um, so it's, there's a lot to be said for uh, picking your groups and then when you're in those groups, modeling the kind of behavior that you want. So he says, given that we are social creatures, what are the implications of that? So he looked at those social interaction patterns using reality mining and found two things, that both productive and creative groups have two things in common. The group members have numerous interactions with highly diverse people outside the group. They're reaching outside for ideas. Then they're bringing them back and they're highly connected to each other within the group. They're interacting frequently in their group. The power of that is that these ideas come in and if it's a high trust group, they don't just accept ideas, they bat them around, they disconfirm each other's beliefs and they end up with great ideas. Here's what Sandy says. Yeah, it, it's sort of the, maybe the, the key thing in terms of uh, building up an organization that's both productive or innovative. Uh, so the, the engagement is uh, essentially getting everybody on the same page. It's, it's in part the social pressure, but it, it's really um, are people working together to work out the ideas of what you're supposed to do. And actually the measurement, nice little mathematical measurement, which is the likelihood of people actually talking to each other that are in the same way uh, work group. And what we find is that that's the biggest factor in productivity, much bigger than personality type or individual IQ, average IQ, or uh, years in the job, things like that, is is are all is everybody in the loop? That's engagement. And then the other thing is is this exploration, which is uh, harvesting ideas from outside the work group. Because if the work group just talks to itself, pretty soon it becomes stuck in a rut. You need to bring things in from outside. And interestingly, in most corporations, that's sort of against the rules. There's an org chart, and you're supposed to communicate up or to the left, wherever there's that little line between the boxes. But we find regularly that the most innovative people are the ones that ignore the <laughs> org chart. And the most innovative groups are the ones that have lots of people that are, you know, talking to everybody else, bringing in different perspectives that are then shared within the group. And that's this engagement and exploration. Uh, it, it, you want to think of it as, how do I get the right set of ideas in everybody's head? Well, you've got to share them with people. You've got to have everybody in the loop. And then you've got to be bringing new ideas in all the time. One of the interesting things, though, is that that's not enough. So why is engagement lead to productivity? The reason it leads to productivity is when you do get people on the same page, they are able to work in alignment with each other, and there's less waste, less friction. Um, less you know, abrasiveness at the boundaries, that requires trust. And one of the things that Sandy also found is that trust was a function of interaction. The more you interact with people in a way that is respectful uh, and, and builds group cohesion, the more likely they are to respond to your requests for help. And when that happens, again, that flow of information and the flow of help uh, increases the productivity in groups too. So there's a lot more going on there than we have time to cover today. But there's for the whole question of trust, it, this is this book has some important ideas. The other thing that an organization can do is make it easier for these explorers to thrive, make it easy for them to look outside their group for ideas. And one of the ways that uh, technical groups and scientific groups have always done this is through technical forums. You can have an online forum all year long, but this, but people tend to get need to get together face to face in order for innovation to really occur. So remember, that was one of the things that set um, this particular body of research in reality mining apart is that it is face to face. Now there is some uh, recording of people when they're doing virtual conversations, like on telephones and so on. But let's say that most of it is actually. Uh, for this per work we just described being done face to face. Now he has done some other work, which we'll, we don't have time to go into today, but I do want to mention it a little bit, is the social networking when it all, is all virtual. He studied successful traders at eToro, which is an online trading uh, group. And what he found was that those traders who were bringing in ideas, listening to the social network, you know, kind of getting the pulse, 
were doing better than those who were isolated and were not, but those who did it too much were some, had some of the worst results of all. And he's pretty skeptical about uh, trend spotting on social networks. Here's what he says. About the wisdom of crowds, I remember in your book you talk about a trading company. What was it, eToro, I think? Yeah, and, eToro. Uh, yeah, talk about a Twitter. Tw it's really interesting because it's a it's like Twitter, except this is one where they're buying and selling gold and stocks and you know euros and stuff like that. And so what that means is that you can see how well the ideas and strategies they adopt do. So if someone's making good decisions, they'll make money. If they're making poor decisions, they'll lose money. And you can ask, well, what sort of social networking? really leads you to make better decisions. And what we find is a very clear thing, which is people who try and go it alone don't do very well. Uh, people who spend all their time, you know, listening to other people and being super social, they don't do very well either. And the reason they don't do well, just like the people who are uh, isolated, is that there's actually... If everybody is sort of engaging in this orgy of, you know, social interchange, it turns out there's not very many new ideas in there. It's just sort of fad after fad after fad. Uh, the people who do really well have a really diverse set of things that they pay attention to. So it's, it's not so much the quantity of social interaction as making sure that it cuts across all those silos, that you hear the different voices. Uh, and the people that do that in this eToro uh, thing make 30 and 40 percent more money than the people that do it alone or the people that are super social. And I think that's a, a general lesson. This is, you know, you have to be careful using these social media because you can. It's real easy to overdo it. It's real easy to have other people overdo it, and you get the impression that oh, everybody believes X, right? Well, maybe not. Maybe it's just everybody's following each other. So it's okay to follow the Kardashians and Barack Obama, but you may not want to follow 800 different people uh, all the time and uh, spend your time doing that, and not that you do. But I thought that was fascinating, a little counterintuitive. He's pretty skeptical about uh, text analysis and sentiment mining, too. And you can read some of that and listen to some of that in my interview with him on the web. I'm going to close on um, a couple of things. One is the New Deal on data. One of the things that Alex does in his spare time, in addition to this research, is he works as the, uh, the data, uh, basically, guru for the World Business Forum, the Davos group, that, as we, it's known to a lot of people. And trying to deal with this whole question of who owns your data about yourself and behavioral data on who you talk to, where you visit on the web, et cetera. And you can see the skepticism in the little dry bones cartoon here. Is somebody spying on my phone or is my phone spying on me? People are beginning to get very nervous about the collecting of data about their web browsing, for example. On the one hand, we like it because it serves up recommendations for us on things that we like. On another hand, it's kind of creepy. So uh, it can be, and it's getting better and better and better. And as we talk about uh, cognitive computing and machine learning, where the machine learns what we're interested in, two things can happen. One, it can narrow our focus to only those things we're interested in, which scares people about innovation, and should, based on what we've heard from Alex, that if we're only getting a small body of information and, uh, uh, and new ideas, we're not likely to find those creative things that happen at the edges and at the intersection of new ideas coming in. The second thing that bothers people about it is that there's too much information about their personal life. So here's a little bit that Alex has to say about that, and, I, and we all are following this very closely, I think. So one of, the, one of the things that was pretty clear at the beginning of these uh, World Economic Forum discussions is that the terms and conditions stuff has to go away. That's Yay. just crazy. It's not respectful. I mean, I, I really think that you know, to move to this sort of digital democracy area, uh, we're going to need to have some sort of mechanism like data banks, you know, personal data banks uh, that help us uh, combat the big guys. Because the danger in this new world is the, the 
company or the government or whatever that has so much data, it's amazing. Uh, you need to have a countervailing force to to make it come out in a way that people are going to be pleased with. Sounds to me like an opportunity for one of your entrepreneurs at MIT to start a business on data banking to capture all these digital breadcrumbs we're leaving behind. You bet. (laughs) I think there's going to be a whole new industry around this, uh, which uh, and the consumer will be powerful by banding together. So that's part of the new world that we're entering, and we've all seen highlights of it. You know that there's meetings going on uh, between all of the big uh, vendors, the Google, Facebooks, Microsoft, and others who have huge web presences and are collecting that kind of data. And they're trying to figure out what is a, a respectful way to do it and in a way that the regulators won't come down on them and shut down their business. So some questions for uh, discussion, and there are many more, is if exploration and engagement matter on productivity and to creativity, what's KM's role? in promoting that greater flow of ideas. With what we have at our uh, disposal today, what we have might have in the future, and is virtual going to do it? Or are we gonna need to continue to look for ways for uh, face-to-face interaction, even if those things are uh, video uh, mediated? And then how can we use social pressure to nudge the behaviors we want in people? We certainly know that it makes a huge difference in what we do. Uh, Behavior is more determined by what happens around us necessarily than our own predispositions. And then how can we uh, help ourselves and others find that Goldilocks Goldilocks zone, not too big, not too small, of participation in social networks so that we can get the best results? And this could be a generational issue with people who are more used to spending more and more time on social media, what happens when they come to work. And then of course the New Deal on data, what are the implications for us? So I barely just touched the surface on what this book is about, um, but I recommend it highly. I also think there's uh, several articles that he's written in Scientific American and others that might be useful to you, and certainly to listen to the interview on the web. Thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to hearing more.